and welcome back to my channel and to our home renovation series. Following on from our last renovation video, today I'll be sharing the renovation of our ensuite bathroom, which was being done at the same time as that downstairs toilet. A couple of months ago, we started to look at tiles, having already had a rough idea of the kind of look we wanted in this ensuite. We have been incredibly fortunate enough to be able to work with Capietra for the tiles in this room. So here you can see me unpacking various different tile samples from them that we selected to start getting an idea of the look that we wanted to go for. We had a few different ideas in mind, which is why there are so many varying samples, but it always helps to see things in the flesh and in the actual light of the space where they'll be going. So let's take you back to how our ensuite bathroom looked before the project started. It is a decent sized room, so we had no complaints about that. But as with every other room we've done so far, for us it just needed updating as it was very old and the look just needed to match our personal taste and the rest of the house. The layout also wasn't really working for us and it felt like it closed the space in. So we decided to tweak it slightly and make the space look and feel more open. There were lots of things I didn't really like about this room, mainly just that everything was old and silicone was pretty much all that was holding everything together. I also didn't like the brown tiles or the fake plastic ceiling, which by this point Simon had made lots of holes in. And the story of that is explained over on our story highlight on Instagram. So let's start this renovation. As I mentioned in the downstairs toilet video, this ensuite was being done at the same time. And we did choose to use a professional, that's Callum, rather than a DIY attempt. Although Simon did lend a hand here and there. And of course I got stuck in with some painting. So first things first, the room needed to be stripped back to the bare bones. Here you can see the progress after day one. The plastic ceiling was gone, leaving behind the framework that it sat on. Tiles were stripped off, the toilet was gone, basin and storage unit gone, and that partition between the basin and the shower area had been demolished to open up the space. Moving on to day two, and during the morning, the old shower tray had been stripped out, the old pipe work removed and capped off, and some first fix electrics starting to go inside the wall. Simon had decided as part of the reno that he wanted to change the existing door we had for a pocket door, which meant that this wall had to be completely demolished and then rebuilt to accommodate the pocket door system inside. An angle grinder was used to cut away part of the cupboard that you can see there on the right, which will be our linen cupboard when we get around to that DIY. And this also gave us some additional space inside the bathroom. The frame and mechanism for the pocket door was installed and the new wall above the doorway and wall inside the bathroom was created and plasterboarded over. You can see where the old entrance wall to the ensuite was on the right. So we've gained about 20 centimeters in room length. Electrics for the new wall lights are now in place along with the plumbing for the basin in its new position. As we did in the downstairs toilet, and the garage conversion, we opted for concealed plaster over spotlights. So those have been installed into the existing ceiling, which was hidden above that plastic sheeting, which was stripped off along with the framework. Day three, and as a side note, we did move out of our bedroom for this project as we knew it would be a messy job and lots of tools stored in here. So day three was a plastering day. Everywhere in here was plastered aside from that back wall as it still needed to be built out for plumbing and recesses and it would be tiled over anyway. So plastering it wasn't totally necessary. You can now see those plastered over ceiling lights and how they just merge seamlessly into the ceiling. And that other hole there is for the fan. So this plaster then needed to be left to air out and to dry thoroughly before we could start with the mist coat. Day four was a plaster drying day. So moving on to day five, and here as the plaster hadn't 
fully dried in all areas yet. We started off by making some decisions on where certain things were going to go. So for example, we bought a bench radiator, which we wanted for under the window, but we needed to decide on the placement of that. So we had a little play around with our fixtures until we made our final decision. The toilet waste and system were installed and like the one in our downstairs toilet we opted for a concealed wall system for a very minimal look. The new pipe work was installed for where the shower controls would be and also pipes for the floor standing radiator bench were channeled into the floor and up. Day six and the pocket door frame was boarded over on the bedroom side and this would be plastered when the plasterer then returned to plaster the downstairs toilet. The back wall had been boarded over to cover the in-wall cistern and the recesses would be carved out of here as you'll see later on in the video. The pipework for the shower head had been installed and again the plaster had another day to continue drying out. Day seven was floor levelling day. The floor needed raising so that once the floor tiles went in, the floor would then be level with the bedroom floor. So as seen in the downstairs toilet video, but here in a little bit more detail, screws were drilled into the floor to act as a guide when pouring the self-leveling compound in. It required lots of measuring to check they were at the correct height. And once they were in place, a primer was applied to the existing floor and left to go off before the leveling compound could be mixed and poured. The compound is a powder which has to be mixed with water and once mixed it needs to be poured very swiftly otherwise it starts to go off and isn't as workable. So Simon and Callum did this together, they had a pretty good routine set up and managed to get the whole area covered pretty quickly and then it was left overnight so that it could dry. On to day eight and the floor had dried nicely and the plaster had also now fully dried. So Simon got up early in the morning to apply a mist coat to that fresh plaster. A mist coat is watered down paint which needs to be applied to fresh plaster before applying your regular paint. If you paint directly onto fresh plaster with regular paint, it will just sit on top and flake off when it's dry. The mist coat absorbs into the plaster, giving a good base to then paint on top of. Mist coats tend to dry pretty quickly, so I was able to get in and start painting with our chosen paint. Capietra have supplied us with their proper good paint along with our chosen tiles, and we chose the color Maples Cloth which is very, very similar to my favorite, Joanna. And like Joanna, Maples Cloth is a nice warm neutral that I suppose could also be described as a greige. I'm applying this to both the walls and the ceiling as I've referenced in other renovation videos. We just like that seamless look from wall to ceiling, especially as this isn't a period property, so we don't have any coving. The paint went on well, nice and even, and it dried pretty fast as well. It's got a very slight sheen to it as it is bathroom and kitchen appropriate paint, but even with this huge window in here, it doesn't look at all shiny. So it gets a two thumbs up from me. Day nine was floor tile day. As mentioned, these tiles were supplied by Capietra. They are the pumice porcelain textured in off white, but they do also come in a camel color, which has a little bit more warmth and a slightly retro feel to it. They're pretty big, so we didn't need many of them. And as they're square, we just opted to have them laid in a grid format to keep it as minimal as possible, as we do have some fussier elements still to come in this room. It's just nice to have something lighter and brighter in here compared to those old dark brown tiles that made the room look and feel smaller. So first of all, the tiles are measured and cut if needed, and then laid into place using the spacers and we have gone for a two millimeter grout gap, which is the smallest grout gap available for these tiles. Once all the tiles are cut and each has its place, the adhesive can then be mixed up and the tiles can be stuck down properly and permanently. Here, all the tiles have been laid and they were left overnight so that they could set thoroughly. Day 10 here, and now that the floor has set, Callum moved on to fitting the shower tray. We opted for a shower tray rather than a tiled shower base because we've had a tiled shower base before 
and it was an absolute nightmare. We learned a very expensive and disruptive lesson when it went wrong, and now we just trust shower trays so much more. And whilst they might not look as stylish as a tiled shower base, one plus side is that they are much easier to clean. We also chose the size and location of various recesses that we wanted. To keep them looking clean with minimal tile cuts, we chose to have them the same height as our chosen tiles, so that the tiles inside would all line up nicely. Our tiles are a decent size, so this was actually a perfect height for a recess. So here at the end of day 10, our recesses were all in place and the shower area had been tanked, which is essentially a waterproof primer. You might also be able to see on the walls that Callum had penciled in the placement of every tile as part of the prep so that we could make sure that all fixtures were going to be going in the right place. So lines lining up with lines. On to day 11, tiling day. The tiles we chose from Capietra are called fondant and they're a ceramic brick style tile Ours are matte white, although there are a few other colours available. And they've got a slight texture to them and a slightly irregular shape. So you might be able to see here the edges aren't totally straight and that's why we like them so much. They're not just a standard subway tile. With this shape of tile, you can create various patterns with them like herringbone and offset brick, but we opted to have them stacked vertically. As with the floor tiles and the tiles in the downstairs toilet, we chose to have the smallest grouting gap possible, which is two millimeters, and we found a really great color match grout, which we hoped would blend in nicely with the off-white of our tiles. Our original plan was to have both the entire back wall and this side wall here on the left from top to bottom. But as we went through various different stages of planning the bathroom, we started to lean more towards the idea of tiling the left wall only up to a halfway point. We had enough tiles to do the entire wall, so we asked Callum to tile up to our desired midway point so that we could see what it looked like, and then if we wanted to go all the way up the wall, we could, and we had that option. On day 12, all the tiles had been adhered to the wall and the trim was put in place around any bare edges and around all three of the recesses. Deciding on the trim color was a bit of a headache, to be honest, because the white trim that was available didn't match the white of our tiles and it just looked a bit odd. So Simon jumped in and made the decision to go for black trim because at least then it would match all of the hardware of our fixtures. Day 13 was grouting day. As our tiles are on the small side in comparison to the huge tiles that we chose for the shower area in our previous home, a fair bit of grout was needed. And as I mentioned, we managed to find a really good color match for the color of our tiles. Even when it comes to white, there are so many varying shades of white, so finding a good colour match can be really tricky. But I'll add the details of the grout that we used down in the description box below the video. The grout colour for the floor tiles was also a little bit tricky as they aren't just one solid colour, they're a bit mottled. And this is why we wanted to keep the grout lines as small as possible so that the lines aren't as visible. And finally, onto the home straight. Days 14 and 15 were for all fixture installations, including this beautiful panda marble basin, which has been sat in one of our upstairs cupboards for over a year because we pre-ordered this basin along with the one in the downstairs toilet before we even moved in. In fact, before we even completed on the sale. Both shower fixtures were installed. We chose to have one overhead fixture and a separate hose fixture. And then the wall fixings for the shower screens were fitted to the walls before sliding in the glass panels and the support bars above, which keep the screens nice and stable. The toilet was another fixture to go in and also the basin tap and other smaller fixtures. So here is the finished result. We're definitely pleased we changed the layout slightly by removing that old shower partition, which just felt like it closed in the space. This feels and looks so much more open, so much lighter and airier. Given that the Panda Marble Basin is quite a statement piece, we wanted to keep the tiles 
pretty minimal, which is why we opted for these matte white vertical tiles from Capietra. But then we've got the slight texture and the mottled effect on the floor tiles, just to add a little bit of detail. As all our metal fixtures throughout the house are black, we went for black in here as well, just to tie it all in. Black does require more upkeep, especially if you have hard water, but from experience, we found that it's worth it. Thank you for watching, and we look forward to sharing our next project with you soon.